Welcome to Consverse, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. This is session 342, optimizing your network for Microsoft Teams tics, tips and tricks. Uh, so we've got Johan and Justin as your presenters for this session. I'll hand over to you, Johan. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so I'm presenting this session uh, with, together with Ina. You know, asked me to talk about this uh, network optimization because it fits nicely into what they're doing on their software front. And Justin is going to explain that after when I finish my presentation. So top five things you need to know to optimize your network for Microsoft Teams, right? Network is really important. Essentially, it's not only the network, but network is a really important piece here. Now, um, let me introduce myself. So I'm Johan Dalleman. Um, I come from Belgium. I work at uh, the Collective Consulting. I'm a managing partner there. I'm focusing on Microsoft UC products. Always been involved in LCS, OCS, Link, Skype, Microsoft Teams, of course, and uh, working together with you now. Um, Justin, can you? Yeah. Can you Absolutely. My name is Justin Harris. I'm the CTO at eNow Software and super excited to join the session today with Johan. Um, we, we've all wondered how we optimize our network. Network is uh, very important when you're talking about cloud technologies. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, I can provide as much value as Johan does at the end of the session by uh, showing you uh, how you can be very proactive and not reactive. Uh, based on some of the content and some of the items that uh, is discussed at this session. So thank you, Johan. All right, so let's dive into the important pieces here. Um, I do want to start out with setting the scene because um, customer networks and networks are designed in a certain way. And usually those companies, organizations, those networks, those infrastructures exist for a long time. And because they have legacy, they are what they are. And working in the new era where everything is connected to the cloud may be not the best way to use a legacy infrastructure because we have to do certain things, right? So we have to go a little bit back in in, in the past and see why certain things happen. So, but in general, we would say it's just a network. So it's always a network which is to blame. Uh, because if, if it's bad quality, it's probably going to be the network. Well, that may be true, but essentially we can't say that because if we want to do a proper implementation of Microsoft Teams, we also have to take into account the network and we have to prepare the network to be in good health for Microsoft Teams, right? So we have some work to do. We cannot just say like the network is magically going to be okay for Teams. No, that's not going to work. We do have to validate a lot of stuff. So going back to pre-internet age, right? Um, yes, I'm not that old, and maybe some of you don't haven't seen that that age before, but it existed, right? Internet is wasn't always there. So in the in the old days, when and of course he yeah, has Skype icons, and of course this is not really a realistic scenario because Skype didn't exist by then, but it's more like how did the networks actually come into play? Like it was only an internal network, right? So the corporate network was a network and you couldn't connect to anything else because there wasn't anything else, right? All the clients connected to each other and to servers, like all internal. And of course that was really easy for security because what's to blame? Um, there's no external connections. Of course, if you go into the building, that's another thing, but it's just the local network. Now, of course, when internet came into play, of course, we wanted to connect to internet because there's really good stuff out there and we need to connect there, maybe for work, maybe for other things, uh, maybe for pleasure, uh, depends. And of course, we want to connect to internet, but well, we need to be safe because internet is not a good place. It, it's, uh, it's tricky for security. We have to do certain things. So, of course, the corporate network needed to extend to internet, but then <clears throat> some building blocks were used, like firewalls and proxy servers, so that we make sure that we we check. Um, uh, so <clears throat> when the client would connect to internet, he would go through a proxy and a firewall, for example, 
and for good reasons, right? Because you want to have security, we don't want to have control, maybe some compliance, whatever you need to have there. But especially it's it's controlled, it's secure, because you cannot just connect from internet to your internal network. So the trust essentially was still the same thing, right? So the trust is still the corporate network. Everything outside of this corporate network is untrusted and has to go through all of those security measures in order to be able to connect there. Now, of course, when people were using the internet, uh, we did have the ability, for example, to work from home, right? So essentially we're going to extend the corporate network, but usually those resources were not, not available directly from the internet. We had to use a VPN or we have to use a VPN to connect to those internal resources. So that's something that is, is available for a very long time. And essentially then you connect to the inter internal resources through this VPN tunnel and everything is fine because it's all secured. Only all the traffic is going to the internal network. Um, security is happy because we're, um, we're not at risk here. So again, for good reasons, right? For security control compliance and whatever you need there to be in place. Um, and then of course, this VPN, if you wanted to connect to internet, you're going through the VPN, going through the proxy and the firewall. So it's like three network components in the middle here. So, uh, but that's the way it is. So of course, if we then look at the cloud era, like where we're living in today, everything all services are moving to the cloud and now we need to consume those services from the cloud now the downside is that those users go to their well their data and their data is secured by all of those networking components so that means probably it's not the best way to do it because it's not optimized to connect to office 365. so from the internal network we still use the proxy and the firewall from the remote sites, we may connect to a central breakout and also connect to a proxy and firewall. And of course, from the VPN, exactly the same thing. So we use the VPN, we connect to proxy and firewall and connect to those services on, on the internet. So again, uh, the trust is still the internal network. And again, maybe the VPN clients as well because uh, those connect to through the VPN tunnel and have to do everything through the tunnel in order to work correctly. So essentially we do have some problems with this because if you use proxy servers, most likely they only allow certain ports to, to work, right? So the, the universal protocols to be using for internet is port 80 and port 443. Um, and that's basically it. Like they don't allow many other ports. So the downside to this is Teams uses a lot of other ports. Um, so if we're using proxy servers and we have to use them, um, that's not a really good idea because it's going to be TCP, 80 and 443 and we do want to use UDP, right? UDP is much better for audio and video quality. So same thing, firewalls are also in place and maybe they're doing the packet inspection, maybe some other security controls in place. They add delay, it, it's a big mess, and maybe all the ports are not open to connect to those services efficiently. Essentially, VPN is used for access internet when you're working from home. So essentially, you, you're making the, the route longer, the destination longer, and the latency longer to connect to those Office 365 services. And the same thing for the remote offices because they have to go over the internal network and then break out centrally. And essentially, Office 365 is not a trusted location, right? Or destination. Um, but the, the difference between trust on the network side, on the data side, is very different, right? Because people trust Office 365 with their data, but not from the network side, which is like, wait a minute, that doesn't really make sense right? Because the data is already there, why wouldn't you trust it? That would be another question, I think. So we have to fix this, right? So we have to fix those things. First of all, we have to 
fix the proxy server issue. So what do we want to do? We want to remove the proxy when we connect to Office 365. Um, as simple, right? We just remove the proxy altogether. That would be ideal, right? No, that's probably not going to work. Um, so we have to do this in, in another way. Um, but potentially when we remove the proxy, the firewall might, might still block the connections going to Office 365. So the solutions here is I do remove the proxy, but of course that's a totally different discussion. Um, the other option is get proper exceptions in place. That's a really important one. So get proper exceptions in place so that all the URLs that we need to connect to in Office 365, Microsoft Teams, Exchange, SharePoint, and so on, they are excluded and we're not going through the fire uh, to the proxy, but directly through the firewall and connect to Office 365. So how do we do this? Um, big companies usually have a proxy point pack file, which includes all the URLs from for uh, proxy exceptions. Um, now Microsoft has a, has a great tool, um, and I'll show you in a minute, to generate those pack files. Uh, another option might be exceptions in the browser, which may be controlled in GPOs, but essentially GPOs is not really flexible, I would say, because only domain admins can do that. And if you're a Teams admin, how would you configure those GPOs? That's a different discussion again. Um, and of course, sometimes people just connect directly to, to internet, which is even better, of course. Um, but essentially the idea is that the URLs are excluded from a proxy and you connect directly without the proxy. Now, the difficult part is that URLs might change um, because it all is documented in online, right? But if you have to do all of those things manually, you probably have to check this maybe a few times a month, right? Because those URLs may change. So luckily, Microsoft um, has those uh, URLs described on those web pages. And luckily, we have a web service that can be consumed by, by network components in order to subscribe to updates and, and configure those components automatically. So these are the, uh, the Skype and Teams URLs and IP addresses. And of course, you don't see the full list here because it's a long list and you see all the ports in here, all the URLs, IP addresses. It's kind of a little bit of work. And the web service essentially gives you the same thing, but then more consumable uh, through JSON or uh, whatever this, this thing is. Uh, but all the information is in this web service which essentially gives you, uh, produces you a file. Now, to generate the pack file, either you do a lot of manual work, but there's a PowerShell script which can help you, right? Get pack file, which is located in this PowerShell gallery and documented in managing Office 365 endpoints. So to just go ahead and download this get pack file, and you just have to do one, one little uh, PowerShell command, and it will download all the required uh, information for you. So you just start up the file, or you just say get file, get pack file, and with all the necessary information here. And then this is going to be generated, and you will save it as a file, and then it can be used um, to exclude all, all those URLs. So um, the important one is. You see here there's direct and there's proxy so you have to configure your proxy in here which is the the right proxy server because microsoft doesn't really know your proxy server so please change it because otherwise your your things won't work anymore so it says um in this case we are going to get all the urls that are required they should go direct right that means not going to the proxy just direct and then some of those URLs we can still allow through the proxy server because they are not really like um, like real time critical. We can still use a proxy server, although we have a choice, right? We can either say yes or no. It will add some delay, but um, it's not really necessary. Now, this is not a full list because I have three dots here. I had to exclude a lot of URLs because the file is just too long to, to fit on my slide here. Uh, but just know there's a there's a, a PowerShell script that will help you generate those files. So 
So now that we fixed the first problem, now we have to fix the second problem, right? Firewalls, because firewalls usually don't allow clients to do anything on the internet, maybe except for uh, port 80 and 443 usually. Uh, so we have to allow more ports there. So we have to fix the firewalls so that the right ports are available and that we actually can go to a destination in Office 365 without being inspected, without being blocked, without being the firewall essentially doing anything. It's just relaying our traffic and it's not looking at it and it's just passing through. The, the security people might say like, okay, but I don't really like that because now I'm, I'm, I'm getting a security breach here. Well, essentially no, because those destination IP addresses and URLs, they own, they are owned by Microsoft. And of course, Microsoft is not going to inject viruses. Well, at least I don't think so. So we have to allow those IPs and required ports. So that's how we fix the firewalls. Um, now, if you cannot do that, because in some, some customers I work with, they have to use Express Route if you cannot do all of those optimizations. Express route is not really recommended, but in some scenarios you, you may need to go there because your infrastructure requires you to do something different here. Uh, but essentially we're not focusing on express route. Uh, this is more like fixing the firewalls. Um, and then if you want to fix the firewalls, essentially we have three types of endpoints. Optimized, allow. So optimized is required. Allow is required. Default is not really required. So, but the optimized one is like 75% of all the traffic and it's most sensitive to network performance, latency and availability. So if you want to optimize the least, at least do the optimized one because that will help you already so much. Now, of course, it's recommended that you also do the allow because it's also required essentially. But the bandwidth connection count is significantly smaller um, so it's not as important as the optimized one. So if you look at the full list here, and I copy pasted it from, from the same URL, um, all, everything highlighted in red is like, okay, that's absolute bare minimum. We have to allow these IPs and those ports. If you do not do that, you will never have good quality in Microsoft Teams, right? Um, and of course, the green ones are the allow required uh, default required. Uh, so all of the required we we are going to to enable to. And then the optional, okay, that's, that's free to choose whether you do that or not. But I would say, why don't you trust Office 365 completely? Because your data is already there. Um, yeah, maybe one important thing here is um, I didn't really talk about it, but the firewalls. Um, uh, like imagine you doing this manually every few weeks. Uh, security people and firewall teams are not going to be happy. So essentially the firewalls can also subscribe to that web service and essentially implement those rules dynamically. That, that would be the best approach, of course. So you don't have to worry about this um, and you get the right rules from Microsoft. So the third problem that we need to fix is VPN because, well, we all know, right? Because nowadays we're all working from home and VPN is used so many times, but it adds a lot of the problem to, to quality in Teams. So essentially we have to make sure that the tunnel is not going to be used and we connect directly because essentially we are already on the internet. Why would we need to help into uh, our data center and then go out to proxy firewall, whatever we have there in place, and then connect to Office 365. No, we don't want to do that. Let's just connect directly because that will be optimized, right? Now, the real downside to this is uh, most security teams say, okay, we, we want to use VPN, but then you say, okay, we want to do direct connections to Office 365. They say, that's fine. You say, okay, then we have to implement split tunneling. Um, then people get a little bit nervous and they say, wow, no, we cannot do that. That's too dangerous. Um, it's not really dangerous because 
you still need to make sure that only the, the ports and the URLs and IPs for Office 365 are allowed because you already allow them on your internal network. Well, at least I hope that you followed two first advices there. So let's just implement this. Um, and it may take a little bit longer because implementing split tunnel is a new change for the security team. So, but they, they will agree at some point, right? So you have to put a lot of effort into, into this, um, but it's worth it because VPNs are contributing a big time to bad quality. So bypass the VPNs, go directly. So, so split tunnel and all the Office 365 IPs, URLs, exclude them from the tunnel. There's Microsoft documentation for you to, how to do that. So again, all the URLs and IPs um, available here, and it's always the same, right? So for the first three problems, there's one source of authority, right? The URLs and IPs and ports for Office 365. Simple, right? So if we are at this point, essentially we already trust Office 365 because we said, okay, let's just connect directly and our quality will be much better. Clients will connect directly. Everyone is going to be happy. Well, it depends, right? We're, we're not finished yet, um, but essentially we already trusted Office 365 this is a big step, right? There are other things that we still need to do. So also really important around trip delays, internet breakouts, like Traditional networks had a central location where internet connectivity was provided, right? And all the remote locations used that central breakout to connect to internet. Well, that's a bad decision if you are consuming cloud services all the time because you don't want to use your MPLS internal network and have to upgrade your MPLS pipes. It's going to be really crazy expensive. Uh, you don't want to do that. So the better approach is to have local internet breakouts, right? So if we look at this, um, if we connect to Teams, the important piece here is you see there's transport relays all over the globe. I'm not sure how many, but there, there are many. And most likely uh, within your country or next to your country, there will be a connection point, so really close to you. So that means the clients will connect as close as possible to the internet egress point uh, to those transport relays. So as short as possible that that connection is, the better your quality will be because the network above the transport relays, this is the Microsoft network, which is super crazy high speed. Uh, I think probably the fastest network um, on the globe. So whenever you get to this transport relay as fast as possible, you're, you're, you're good to go, right? Because you're in the safe zone. Now, if your remote site also needs to connect to this central location and then go out to this transport relay, well, probably that's not going to be the closest one and you're introducing much more delay than you actually want. And I do have some figures that we need to take into account. So essentially it's better to have this one connect here and then the remote site connect to wherever it's closest uh, transport relays, right? So you should connect locally to internet. So how to fix those delays? Um, well, it's not fixing all delays, right? It's just fixing the remote site delays is local breakouts. Um, how you fix potential delays uh, from within your company connecting to internet is make sure that your internet provider has direct peering at Microsoft. Um, I think by now most internet providers have direct peering because we're talking about this for a long time. Um, and then express route, if if nothing else, if, if your solution really can't can be uh, can be fixed, we have to go to express route. Now these are the figures that are important, and there are two columns, right? Um, and we have those metrics: latency, run trip delay, packet loss. Uh, jitter, packet reorder, all of those things. The important ones are round trip delay, packet loss, and jitter, right? Uh, round trip delay from your edge of the network, which means where your network connects to internet, that point needs to be 60 milliseconds. 
wherever your clients are, they're usually within the network. It needs to be under 100 milliseconds. Of course, we don't want to have packet loss, um, and Cheater should be under 15 or 30 milliseconds. So those are the, the key values, and this is how it works. So we have the network edge connected to a transport relay. So this, this was the first column in the table. And then the second column was like connecting from the client machine. Um, so a good question is, well, how can we measure this? Well, there's some good news. There's a Skype for Business Network assessment tool which you can run. Uh, there's also another tool which I will highlight. Uh, but this one has the advantage that you can essentially run it and you can keep it running for a few days or maybe a week or maybe even longer and then collect all the data and look at the, the trending and all the connections that the tool made. So it's looking at the longer time frame and checking whether everything is, is, is good, right? Because doing one test call doesn't mean that your network is, is excellent fit um, and it will work all the time. No, we have to test in the longer period of time. So essentially this tool allows you to do that um, and you can test on Wi-Fi, LAN, VPN, remote, wherever you want because it's a tool you run on a normal desktop PC, right? You can put this PC wherever you want. Maybe it's your PC, maybe it's your, your colleague's PC. Um, you can do all those validations. Um, it does two things. It connects to the relays, checks for the ports are available and then does test calls, right? You see this is one test call of 100 in this case. So it says this is the run trip delay, 12 milliseconds. We have um, uh, jitter 10 milliseconds. We have zero packet reorder and uh, where's packet loss? Yeah, it's really, really small. So you see it, it does all of those tests and it really does a, a, a real call, right? It, it sends media to a transport relays and it gets media back and then reports on that. So it's not just a ping or something, it's real media. I will will use the media ports as well. So of course, now we check this, and this is of course manual work. We have to get all of those numbers and make them available in Excel sheets so that we know okay what was the the trending and what are the minimums and maximums. Um, you can create charts from there. You see, there's one spike. Do we really need to worry about one spike? Maybe not. Um, you see, for example, um, this is the run trip delay. Um, so remember everything under 60 from the edge and under 100 for uh, your clients, so it, it should be fine. And then uh, with inside, for example, we have, uh, let me see, average jitter in milliseconds. Um, if you remember correctly, it needs to be under 30 milliseconds. You see we do have regular spikes here, so potentially we have to look at the Wi-Fi network. Right? But the important thing is we have to look at this from a longer period of time and see at the, the, the spikes, I would say. Um, there is really, this, this is a new tool, right? So the network onboarding tool, and it's kind of interesting because it shows you a lot of information. Uh, it's located at connectivityoffice.com, and you can say this is my city, and then it essentially collects and calculates a lot of things. So it does see I'm located over here. This is my internet peering point and I'm connecting to the data center in Office 365 in Amsterdam. So it tells me what is the route. So if I would connect to internet somewhere in Asia, well, the arrow would go to Asia and then point to uh, Netherlands data center and then you know, okay, this is probably not really good uh, because it can be shorter. So it does give you some highlights here uh, you and 60% best performance, 30% uh, above ad average. So this is about 90% and then 4% average. So I, I'm somewhere in the 90% category, which probably is going to be fine. Uh, and then you have some details here, like your location, what is the distance to uh, your network egress location? Um, where is the data center for Microsoft Exchange? Um, and then you can do some more detailed tests. You have to put your uh, tenant name here. Well, on Microsoft.com, you run the test, you download a small tool, and then it does even more checks, your information, um, 
there's one test that apparently failed, but my internet connection dropped a few times uh, last week, so uh, that was probably the reason why. Uh, so your information, it checks online, uh, Exchange, and then SharePoint as well. Of course, we are interested in Teams media quality, so it checks. Uh, it only does one call, right? So it's not the same as the previous uh, testing tool. Uh, but it tells you what is this values for this one one test. And essentially, it says all connectivity pass and then um, all, all the uh, trace routes that you connect to internet. So um, I'm not sure if it was in the screenshot, but OK, maybe I skipped it somewhere, but it says I'm sure it says, uh, oh yeah, here it is. So I was looking for this one, like you're not using a proxy server, you're not using a VPN client. So potentially you can also check this. Um, I haven't tested it with a VPN client, but uh, this is also good information to have. So then the last piece, we are going to look at quality of service and internal firewalls because not necessarily external firewalls contribute to problems, but also the internal ones, if you have them, but I see that happening in, in, in Europe a lot. So ideally, when two clients do a call, they connect directly to the endpoints. The endpoint is a device where the user is sitting or, or calling with. So it's a point-to-point -point communication. But of course, if there's internal firewalls, they may be blocked. And then luckily, and this is a side effect what transport relays do, they actually relay this call as well, but you see that's not the best possible path that these this media can take because we're traversing the firewall, going to internet, going back to the firewall and going to that user. So the path is going to be longer, the call is succeeding, but we do have to check for this because it's not really optimal. Same thing applies for remote locations, which may have firewalls as well. So potentially it's blocked and potentially we're traversing the internet again and of course that path is going to be longer maybe uh, or maybe not um, but you see it's coming going to internet and coming back in so we have to fix those firewalls and exactly the ports that the clients are going to be using and essentially when we fix those firewalls with the ports that those clients are going to be using then we can also implement QoS if you want to we should have direct connections. And then um, how do we fix those firewalls? Um, these are the ports that's going to be in use for Skype for Business and Teams, right? So these are the default ports. They have been there for, I think, the last five years or maybe even longer. Uh, probably since OCS. Um, yeah, I think so. So you need 20 ports for audio, 24 video, 24 application sharing, and 24 file sharing. So audio and video have their proper ports um, and then uh, application sharing and file sharing, they share the same range, um, just for you to know, right? Um, so if you do quality of service, you can do that for audio and video, but not separately for application sharing because file sharing will be in the same, same path here. Now, file sharing is for Skype. Uh, Teams uses a different mechanism for file sharing anyway, so. So those are peer-to-peer -peer communication and your client will always send from those ports and receive on those ports. So if you want to change them, you can, right? And so in the admin center, you can actually change those ports. You can say we want to enable quality of service marking and then specify port ranges, like maybe it needs to be something different. It's possible, but I don't see that happening too much, although Sometimes when, when people say, OK, we have a Skype on-prem environment and we have everything configured already with other type of ports, OK, let's maybe adjust those ports to whatever Skype is using so that we don't have to do so much more work on the network because it's already there, right? So then if we want to use quality of service, we know the port ranges. This is going to be audio and we have to tag it with the SCP value 46. Uh, and it's considered to be expedited forwarding. And then we have video application sharing can be in different classes, right? Audio always needs to be prioritized above video and then application sharing. So 
Just important to remember, port ranges are adjustable and teams will respect the existing configuration, meaning that whatever is being used in Office 365 for Skype will also be used for Teams. It's not Skype for Business on-prem, right? So you do have to do those configurations for the cloud. And then if you have policies for Skype for Business, um, you have to add teams.exe to this policy because otherwise Teams is not going to be tagging those packets because uh, QoS on the device is managed by GPOs, at least on the Windows clients. So uh, that's something you shouldn't forget because if you do not add teams.exe to that policy or create a new one for teams, uh, it won't tag. So um, let's look at the summary. Like your road to happiness, it's not blaming the network, it's making sure that the network behaves properly and that you explain that to the networking teams and make sure that they configure it correctly. So proxy server exceptions, proper firewall configuration, all the ports and IPs and URLs. We have to implement split tunneling on VPN. We have to make sure that our internet connections are going good, uh, run through delays is optimized, and then potentially is more, I would say, opt optional, but still important. Uh, QoS or internal firewalls like uh, configuring the right ports. So Justin, I think um, you can take over here. Perfect. Thank you, Johan. I think understanding the uh, road to happiness is important in uh, all areas of life, right? <laughs> well, let me share my screen. Okay. My job here is, is to really expand upon uh, Johan's discussion and, and provide value and showcase how you as the admin, the IT admin, can help manage those items that Johan discussed to make sure that you not only have a good baseline of the end user experience, but that you know when there are issues and you can react uh, proactively and not after the fact. Uh, conversely, if you're a member of the Modern Workplace team and you need to measure adoption of Office 365, um, we'll, we'll quickly discuss that. Or if you're the IT business leader and you own licensing and the Microsoft EA agreement, and you need to dial in and make sure that your employees are leveraging the, the, the services and entitlements that they have, uh, we'll, we'll go into uh, that and discuss this. So it'll be a whirlwind tour. Uh, if I hit on anything quickly that resonates with you, uh, please come visit the eNow family either at the in the expo or the, the chat room that's posted uh, in the chat uh, because you'll be able to enter to win a $350 gift card uh, to the Microsoft Store as well. So our Office 365 management platform helps organizations, uh, large and small, detect outages immediately and validate the end user experience. And, and as you discussed, when you start using cloud SaaS application, the network is one of the most important uh, items that need to be resolved and, and need to work in order to ensure a great end user experience. Um, our clients like Facebook and VMware love us because ultimately we help them discover problems before their employees call into the help desk and log those tickets. So the most popular feature of the platform here that I'm showing is the design language uh, that we've used, that visual look and feel. Um, you'll notice it's a stoplight system, green, red. Uh, we purposely did that because we need to make sure that this platform is easy enough for the NOC to use uh, and that they don't wake you up as the level three admin in the middle of the night when there isn't a tr true issue, uh, but it needs to provide enough detail to the level three admin to go and triage something uh, that may be going wrong or, or something that may not actually be working. And what's important to note is the whole reason we were able to do that and design it is because this was built by admins. It was built by an exchange admin that had a consulting company that uh, built a tool and accidentally turned into a, a software company here. So let's talk about a real world example. 
uh, we'll use the team's workload. Um, as you see here on the dashboard, we're looking at on-prem exchange servers. We all typically have some still. Uh, we're looking at the Office 365 services. Everything looks great. Um, if I scroll down here though, you'll actually see some blinking red lights. So in kind of one look, we're driving, you know, from a visual standpoint, your eyes right to where the problem is. And, and in this instance, it looks like I have a problem with my network. And specifically, I have a problem with the team's network. And if I go back and look at the other blinking red light, I could see that I have an issue with teams and, and the team's test. So the question really uh, comes up, when there's issues with teams, how do you know if the problem is on your side or on Microsoft's side? And when you look at that holistically as an admin, that's a deceptively difficult question to answer. I mean, that's one of the, the, the value propositions of the Office 365 service is, is that you as the enterprise can leverage your on-prem assets uh, and, and kind of glue them together with Microsoft's cloud offering. And now you have the best of both worlds. Uh, you know, if I scroll all the way down, I, I see I can monitor Active Directory, on-prem Active Directory from the same dashboard and kind of drilling down, I, I can see, uh, do I have expensive LDAP queries or, or is something else uh, going on? And, and so being able to quickly answer uh, whether you're in the NOC or you're a, an admin, is it a me problem? Is it a Microsoft problem? Is it a directory authentication problem? Is it an expired certificate problem? Is it a network latency problem? Uh, is kind of half the battle. And when you kind of drill down into that a little bit more, you can ask another question is, how do I know when only a subset of my employees, especially now that we're all working from home, uh, if there's only employees in one location that have issues accessing Teams, how do I know that before tickets start flooding the help desk? And, and how do I pinpoint where the location is of the problem and then whose problem is it? Uh, so in, in this example, we're actually leveraging uh, end user experience probes, uh, little pieces of code that you can install on Windows 10 machines in different areas of your network um, that will run the same set of rich synthetic transactions to, to really mimic how your employees log in, authenticate, and use Teams. Um, you know, it's not just one team. It's not one exchange test. There, there's uh, multiple steps and facets uh, to those tests. Uh, DNS, auto discover, authentication, ADFS, certificates, um, Azure AD Connect, you know, all of those things are tested and monitored uh, within this platform here. So the magic here is that uh, you're able to quickly see, uh, in this instance, in my main data center, I don't have an issue with Teams. All the Teams tests are passing. But if I scroll down in the New York location, Teams, the Teams tests are working. But I'm having an issue in London where the team's tests are failing. And what's also interesting here is if I look at London, SharePoint tests are passing, Exchange tests, uh, directory and authentication, they're all passing. So is it a Microsoft problem? Is it a me problem? Uh, being able to kind of quickly look at the service health dashboard, you know, that's one of the questions that uh, typically gets asked is, how is this different than what Microsoft provides? Um, but being able to use those synthetic transactions and mimic how your employees are connecting uh, is extremely important. Um, we know, as with most things in life, uh, Twitter typically is a leading indicator as well. Uh, so we, we tie in the Microsoft, uh, the Microsoft 365 Twitter feed to kind of give you additional layers to uh, troubleshoot where the problems uh, may be. Um, jumping over to the uh, cost optimization, the, the modern workplace team, where your, your charter is to really drive adoption 
and to make sure that you're solving business problems quickly with the Microsoft collaboration stack. It's a great bit of technology. You, you can kind of work anywhere as you know, the, this whole uh, global health pandemic ha has demonstrated beautifully, um, but you're not gonna get the value of that as an organization if your employees aren't using the tools that they have. Uh, so quickly, uh, what I like to kind of show here is um, if you look at the reporting library, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but it's just kind of scroll through. There's a, a vast array of reporting here. Uh, I like to kind of show and highlight the Microsoft uh, op, the 365 reports because quantifying adoption and tying that to an ROI uh, is a little bit more nuanced than did somebody log in once over a specific time period, right? You really need to get down and understand usage, you know, how many chats, how many calls, and then be able to not only extrapolate that information, but then kind of create a baseline and evaluate it against other peers. Uh, so uh, having that ability allows the modern workplace team to um, successfully move forward with their charter to help drive adoption. Uh, and then ultimately from a cost standpoint, uh, one of the, the items that I really like to showcase is uh, looking at uh, license cost uh, you can quickly see here one look uh, what I'm spending, uh, what I'm losing uh, based on unallocated licenses or inactive license costs. Um, I can drill down. Uh, one of the things that uh, our customers love is I could look at the project online professional and I could see that I have one inactive user. Now I can click right in line here and see who th that user actually is. Um, the, the other component that I can get is as we grow and uh, we mature in uh, in the cloud offering, uh, very very often we see where uh, users may have been given initially maybe an E3, uh, then they got a Power BI Pro license maybe, and then maybe the, the true value of the Office 365 suite was seen, and we moved them to E5s to get more secure activity entitlements. Um, not cleaning those things up, uh, you can end up with uh, what I call overlapping licenses. So being able to quickly identify those uh, where you can see that there may be three licenses assigned to this user that are overlapping, what they are, uh, which ones should actually be kept, and then your monthly and yearly savings uh, for that. And then uh, lastly, the second report uses a back-end proprietary algorithm where we actually review your user activity in Office 365 and we look at what entitlements or what parts of the entitlements are used and then uh, we can actually suggest based on real world usage. So it's not a what I hope or what I desire my employees use. It's what's really being used uh, and, and we can show you uh, how or what license types these users can be moved to. We give you data, uh, the supporting data to give you kind of build that trust and credibility as to why that could happen. And then ultimately you can kind of see your monthly and yearly savings. So these reports help you as the modern workplace team or the IT business leader really identify those trends in uh, license allocation and get that visibility um, that, that you need. So this concludes our session today. Um, it, we started off where Johan discussed the common pitfalls of uh, the, the network and how it can break your employees' experience with Teams and, and really cause a uh, poor end user experience. And then my goal was to uh, show you kind of based on that knowledge uh, of what needs uh, that what needs to be done to safeguard against those pitfalls? Uh, what platforms and automation can you put in place where you could be proactive as the IT admin? And if any of those configurations deviate or uh, any problems arise, you can quickly spot them uh, just at a glance. Uh, we went through uh, a team's story, uh, but obviously 
not only is it just Teams, but all of the workloads in Office 365 kind of follow suit. Uh, that, that Teams was just one uh, example that we, we were using. Um, so uh, before we can conclude, uh, please, if you haven't already, go into uh, the, the chat room that was entered, uh, enter in to win that raffle and that $350 gift card to the Microsoft Store. Uh, and with that, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you very much, Justin. Thanks, Johan. Uh, th there is a breakout meeting after this. Uh, I've just posted the URL in the announcement. Um, so if you want to uh, speak with Justin or Johan, um, go over there, head into that Teams meeting and you, they can answer any questions for you. Uh, also, don't forget to submit your feedback um, for the session as well. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll end the session for you. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Johan.